Hey everyone and uh, welcome to the Loop Live. Um, we're going to be talking today about B2B influencers and uh, SMEs. Um, I've got Gatano with me as well who will be joining very shortly. Um, but I'd love to hear where you're all uh, tuning in from uh, and let me know in the chat. Uh, it would be great to see who we've got we've got listening. So just waiting a couple more minutes uh, for for Katano, but see we're all over the all over the globe at the moment. New York, Boston, Manchester, London, Buenos Aires. There you go. Got a great crowd. Um. So, yeah. So today, uh. I'm going to run through basically our influencer strategy at Cognizant, B2B influencers and subject matter experts. And join with me, I've got Gatano Donati, who is actually working with us uh, in part as a as a, a subject matter expert and influencer for us as well. So I think what it will do is it will give you a nice uh, introduction to kind of how you can possibly do it and also hear from the horse's mouth about how it works for them as well and you know how it fits in with Katana's philosophy and how um uh yeah how he feels about like working in partnership with a company as well so yeah i hand over to you as well Katana to introduce yourself yeah th thanks Liam for the warm introduction what's up everybody you know, I've been working with Cognizant now uh, for the past six months on various different marketing initiatives, but one of them has been sort of the give your point of view of what's happening in the market. You're somebody that's actively in the trenches every day working on marketing with a lot of different companies. So you have credibility behind you. You have an interesting perspective on things. And let's use somebody outside of the company to, you know, basically create content, work on content strategy, create videos, be a part of the podcast, be a part of webinars, um, invite people from my network onto the Cognizant podcast. I mean, there's a lot of different techniques and tactics that we'll talk about today. Those are just some of them, but um, I think Cognizant has definitely taken a really interesting approach to getting outsiders, bringing them into their content and marketing strategy and using basically external support to drive content. Awesome. So we'll get started with that. Um, so I think to to kick off, and I think a lot of people have questions around uh, around this, is um, does influencer marketing sort of exist in B2B? Um, so we're all super familiar with like B2C brands working with influencers that's been flying around now for, you know, over well over a decade. Um, and it's in, a, in a, like every path that we sort of consume. Um, and I think although now people are used to influencers in B2B as well, especially if you're active on LinkedIn or any or like any social media platform like YouTube or TikTok as well that make, takes a, um, has like a, a huge portion of influencers on there. Although we may be influenced by them, we don't always think oh, they're, they're necessarily an influencer. Maybe they are work, just working for a company and it may feel like they're just, you know, pushing that narrative or they are, uh, yeah, they, so it may feel like, oh, they're not an influencer, they're just someone like expressing their opinion. But really, uh, I think when it comes to the basis of it, that is that is what's happening. Um, so I think to answer whether B2B influencing exists, I like to think we've got to start with like, what is an influencer? Um, and to me, and how I would define it, is that an influencer is an influential person uh, in who has a reputation for being an expert in their own field. They've curated an audience, so uh, like followers, that trust and respect their opinion and point of view. And they're also a content creator who promotes their expertise in a way that engages and entertains their audience. So like on this slide, for example, I have a few people that I would say that are quite obvious B2B influencers in, in, in um, in marketing, especially, we've got like Chris Walker and David Gerhardt, who's and David Gerhardt's gone out and is uh, basically really taking on taken on his influencing career and made a company out of it. 
uh, and a community. So I feel like he's an extremely uh, strong example of it. And then we're obviously in Cognizant, we work in sales and, and another like a big sales influencer out there is, is Josh Braun, who I think is a massive influencer, the example of an influencer who has a philosophy, a point of view, uh, and like an intense following of people who, who love it. So if that sort of like now made you think like, okay, yeah, I do, I do know influencers. I think they, they do exist. Uh, uh, hopefully that sort of showed you, showed you that position. And then I think the other thing is to think, it's like, you might think, okay, so influence exists, I get it, but why, why would I, why, why do I need to include them into my marketing strategy and what's like actually the benefit? Um, so B2B influencers are more than just their audience. So I think this is the, the thing, like sometimes you might think, oh, if I could, I can reach all these people just by paying to uh, on LinkedIn, I, or like paying on any channel or creating or buying uh, B2B data and, and collecting or creating a newsletter and getting and reaching an audience like that. But content creators, influencers are more than just uh, their audience. They're something that can help us like actually operate like a media company and create content. So influencers not only provide an audience, but they also provide authority to your content, which is something that is essential for any content to fly and work. Uh, we all know that content uh, just written by a content marketer without any expertise doesn't drive that engagement that we need because it doesn't have that authority and expertise to it. Um, they can provide a unique POV, like a unique point of view. So um, when we think about uh, people or like people that we find really interesting, they have a unique perspective on something. Uh, we don't want to hear those same or see those same drab articles that just express the same points over and over again. Your top 10 reasons for this, or top seven reasons for that. Um, that gets nowhere. A unique point of view. And we're going back and looking at Chris Walker or Josh Braun. That's something they have in like buckets, which is what creates this big influencing uh, audience around them. They can deliver content in easy and consumable formats. So um, some of the best influencers out there, B2C and B2B, are just great at creating that bite-sized content that keeps you engaged. Um, we've been using subject matter experts in B2B virtually for a long time, but they've just been like contributing maybe to white papers and blogs and these long style formats sometimes that just are actually extremely dull. And uh, whether they're like, super clued up or not um, is relevant because the content doesn't get consumed. A good influencer helps deliver that content in a way that actually gets consumed by an audience. They can interact with a highly engaged audience or community. So if you ever see like an influencer at work on, on LinkedIn or any of the social media platforms, you'll see that they are able to then interact with that community directly there. Um, and this goes on to the second point, provides like a human face to your brand. Um, so more than just their audience there, they're now interacting with uh, your ICP and your customers and providing sort of like a direct content for contact for expertise on the solution that you provide and expertise in their, in the uh, your ICP's like field of work um, and can really like help resonate with your, with your audience. And then finally, they act as a catalyst to dark social. So if you've got all of these people, you know, coming out and talking about uh, your company online, uh, all those posts where people are like, oh, should I, should I get Cognizant or Zoom info? Uh, this is the point where your, your influencer can step in and interact with the, with the, um, with your audience and like really like push and scale that word of mouth. Um, and people will come to them directly as well, which is something I'll move on to later, which also adds to this sort of human face to your brand. So, oh, have I skipped to this slide? No, I've done the right one. Cool. <laughs> so now that we've identified what an influencer is and what they look like in a B2B setting, you may be thinking, okay, I'm working with one. Uh, I, I already, I, I think I already know one. Uh, and uh, like, but how, how do they work in a field of like with a company? So um, B2B influencers uh, could be, and I think often come in, B2B influencers are content creators uh, or influencers that are employed within your business. So subject matter experts in your business who provide and who maybe have another role, but like provide um, expertise into uh, your subject matter where you need it. 
They could be external creators or subject matter experts that you end up running free partnership-based activity with. This happens all the time. There's lots of people who want to contribute to content, get their name out there, but they, they'll do it for free on and off. Or you can have the uh, like an external creator or subject matter expert that you hold a relationship with, uh, at, like a paid relationship with that regularly contributes to your content. So before I go on to sort of our example of how we do it, I was like, uh, would you say there's anything else here, Gatane, that I've kind of missed and those reasons for for why you would bring it like bring an influencer in and how they could possibly work with your with your business? No, I, th I think you covered all the bases. You know, um, I, I, I think it's probably what I'd say about it is not a lot of companies have taken the leap or have prioritized this. Like, I think most companies are still kind of stuck in that, you know, hamster wheel of you know, we need to scale SEO. What should we do? You know, let's use external, just, you know, run of the mill freelance writers, or let's uh, use AI content creation tools, or let's try to do it ourselves internally, but it's going to be a really slow moving machine. Or if it's video, it's, well, we don't have anybody in house to do video. We don't, we're not prioritizing video right now. Let's just stick to, you know, the basic sort of techniques for driving website traffic. So, you know, it, I, I would say basically like for a company that is not really thinking about this or has deprioritized it for a long time, in order to make the shift, you kind of need to rally people internally around this, this movement. And, you know, you kind of need a, uh, a bit of a consensus on it, right? Like it's going to be hard for just like one content marketer to drive this kind of change, depending on the size of your company. Like if you have a startup, uh, maybe, you know, the only content marketer out there for, you know, working for a small company, you may be able to create this, this movement because there's not a lot of, you know, internal consensus that's needed. You might just need to, you know, convince your CEO or founder because you're working directly with a founder if you're a small stage company. But if you're larger, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people that are involved and it's going to take real work to even get everybody on the same page about why we should be doing this. So probably, um, I think, you know, from a tactical standpoint, Liam, you covered it. I would just add that, um, you know, from like a strategic alignment standpoint, you kind of do need people bought into this. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah, 100%. And uh, I think actually that goes on well to what um, the next few slides, because really last year was our experiment with this. You know, this is this is what we said we felt like we have the we have the outward marketing uh, expertise uh on like socials um in-house you know alice does a lot of posting was extremely active um but what we were missing was our was our like sales uh active persona um out in on on socials influencing as well with like expertise that we could use um in our content um to create uh that authority as well um and make it yeah and make our content 10 times better so we we got the buy-in we managed to convince um senior leadership that this was something we could trial and test and we did it um on a short-term basis to begin with with then with with if we could prove success that then we could we could extend it and then um so i'll go into the next slide basically before i give it all away now <laughs> but so last year uh we started working with Ryan. So Ryan is uh Ryan Razor is a professional SDR by his own definition. Uh he absolutely loves the job and loves uh SDRing. Um he's an expert in cold calling uh and outreach and he co-authored uh Outbound Sales No Fluff. He's also founder of his own business, Phone Ready Leads, and really importantly, he has uh 28k following on LinkedIn of who, what I would actually describe as diehard fans. They, they absolutely, they love Ryan. And in 2022, he was our brand ambassador and subject matter expert for Cognizant. Um, but importantly, we didn't, we didn't employ uh, Ryan. We, uh, we didn't, he didn't join the company, um, but we uh, formed a, a paid partnership with him um, to create content and uh, promote uh uh, like his sales knowledge and work with content with us as well as Cognizant at the same time. So contract, you may think, tell me more, how does that work? Uh, sounds great in practice. Uh, love to know more about it. So yeah, exactly. We, we basically had to work out a way that we could work um, 
create a, a system where we could say that we knew what we wanted to get out of Ryan. We, like, we knew we had to prove this out. We needed to show to senior leadership that it would work and how it would work. Um, and we also wanted to give structure that how uh, on the activity um, that Ryan felt like he would need to provide to us to know that it was success. So really what we did was we outlined right down and you got switch, you could do this in any way you want. So they're very detailed, the type of activity that we wanted to fulfill uh, each month um, uh, with Ryan. And we did this right down to like uh, X number of deliverables uh, per month. But things you can include in it could be like how many video snippets you're going to have created, whether you're going to have like a YouTube series, like and how many episodes you might be doing of that a month. Um, webinars, if, if Ryan hosted a number of webinars with us and it would be like, down to how many webinars per month we were going to be doing hosting the podcast how many hours of episodes that that was going to include um how many guests that uh ryan would be able to source for us as well um right down to uh the number of blogs per month whether he would be available for in-person events um newsletters and his contribution to those um how many how often we were able to post on key socials using his channel and whether that was something that he was open to and being able to share our his partnership with us on his socials too uh, and us being able to share it outwardly as well so now this one is really interesting so you might be thinking great found ryan you've got a situation where you can like work with him um and you know how you're like, um, yeah, you know exactly the number of deliverables you're going to do, but how did you choose Ryan? And then how you were you sure that this was going to be a partnership that would work? Um, so I think there's a few things that you need, you need to consider. Um, and I think it's really, really important to build that relationship um, and try before you buy. Um, and this is kind of what we did with Ryan. So We'd actually run like a number of different webinars with Ryan previously uh, with Josh Braun and we'd got to know him um, and we got to understand his content. And we thought, uh, and where we learned that we then we could see some alignment between the two of us. So by the time we were actually reaching out to do more content, um, it made sense because we'd already run a, a few successful webinars with him. He'd contributed to blogs. We were complete, like he had the same vision of how, um, data could be used in sales um it was we had to, we figured out that alignment before we went any further and like made any sort of like paid commitment to it um we also had to look at like whether you're a natural brand fit right so you don't want uh, an influencer that comes in that doesn't really fit with your brand uh causes any um issues or sort of situations where you're like oh this won't this isn't something we would say xyz so all of that part is something that you want to consider beforehand and really that try before you buy helps you get to know that as well. Um, the other thing that we we looked at and I think is always important is just to talk to your ICB. So we knew that he was already liked by a large portion of our audience uh, and watched by them just because we asked. So we went out and we spoke to customers and we asked, where do you get your information from? What influences do you like following? Um, who, yeah, who do you respect? Like what's, um, where, like, where would you go to learn new information about sales? Um, and that, that was key as well. So it's, you need to have that, that side that the people that, that are going to be, uh, promoting and presenting your content are people that your audience are already kind of interested in and want to learn from as well. Um, then I think you also want to look at like audience, audience size, like across different channels as well. Um, so, uh, Ryan's like uh, LinkedIn uh, like audience isn't massive, but what it's great at and um, and what we liked about it is it's very very um, targeted and honed. Like he has a huge uh, that twenty eight k is of following is like very sales focused, um, and that's something you really want to sort of like dig into to just make sure you understand that audience. The network and value add. I think this bit is really key as well. Ryan looks great network across sales and actually got so many great people on the podcast, uh, people he knew and um, had worked with before, which actually just like, which has a multiplier effect, right? Because then after that, we were able to build um, strong connections with these people. And, and then that grows and grows as, as your network grows with it. Um, so this was something that like was really important too. And, and Ryan was able to interest, 
introduce us to loads of people like his relationship with Josh Braun was really great as well for the for running some of those um live events that they did together and then content creation is how good are they at creating content how up for they are creating content and different formats of content as well um what you don't want is like a great subject matter expert a great mind but you can only really ever get like a white paper created or a um or a uh, like blog written because they don't want to be in front of camera or they don't want to be doing anything uh, more exciting and more engaging. Um, so I've, I feel like I've, I've, a story that I would always put here is my dad is a chef uh, and he has a very specific opinion on TV chefs. Uh, uh, he, in the battle between uh, Gordon Ramsay and Jamie Oliver, he says that he re he likes Gordon Ramsay. He dislikes Jamie Oliver now. Gordon Ramsay, he thinks, uh, can is a professional who was a professional chef before he became a TV chef, so he can stand the heat of the kitchen. Whereas he believes that Jamie Oliver was only ever a TV chef and therefore uh, doesn't listen to a word he can say. And I think you've got to find this balance between subject matter expert and content creator um about and and therefore like so that you know that they can create engaging content but also have that really like important uh, like ex expertise and pov that your your audience will actually be interested in um but yeah so and, and interestingly i suppose where we started working with you katano was like really started off uh like working on our seo side helping and consulting with us um I mean, we were a fan of you as well, but you knew who we were. So it's like, how would how would how did it come to from your side as well? Like, when you decide whether you want to work with a brand, and and how did it sort of come together for you? Yeah, I mean, I think the same way you guys think about who to work with uh, from the influencer perspective, uh, the influencer also needs to think about is this brand a good fit for me? So like. I, I think that the initial conversation was with Alice um, and it started off as just like um, I told her, you know, I'm working with some companies now. I've always loved the way you guys go about marketing and I'm just going to throw my hat into the ring and say, um, if you guys were interested in doing some work together, I would really love to explore that. It was, it was as simple as that. And um, you know, she, she was open to it and we just started brainstorming about stuff and then it kind of steamrolled from there. You know, I think the try before you buy definitely rings true. Like, I think we started off with just some very basic SEO consulting. And then we realized that, like, our work styles were very much aligned. Uh, I think you guys were definitely bought into some of my perspectives on marketing as well. And were a fan of basically the way that I would put that stuff out there into the social social universe. And I think, it, it, you know, you guys were definitely willing to try some things and uh, do some stuff differently as well. Like you, you guys clearly didn't want to keep perpetuating the same kinds of narratives that were already beaten to death in the B2B community. So you guys were kind of looking for a fresh voice to, to pair up with. And I think, you know, my kind of no bullshit cheeky style also works. I think you, you guys also have some of that sort of, you know, backbone to you. And, uh, um, you know, I definitely... I, I look to work with companies that are willing to say something and that are willing to take a side and that are willing to actually not give the dry uh, neutral response, you know, the play it safe route. You, you guys definitely are willing to, you know, pick a side and, you know, push some buttons and, you know, put some interesting perspectives out there. So I just, I just like B2B companies that are willing to do things differently and try some new stuff. Um, that's really what it comes down to for me. And then plus, you know, I, I, the culture that you guys have is really good. So I know your, your CEO, James posted about it, but the attitude of just, you know, be nice, you know, don't be a dick. Uh, we can be cheeky and edgy, but you know, you can still be, you can still be a nice, enjoyable person to work with. And I, and you know, I, I, I think, uh, every single person I've worked with at Cognizant has really had that spirit. So, you know, it's and plus it's a feel thing. You got to feel it out as well. You can just kind of feel when the chemistry is there, you know, mm -hmm. over the first couple of calls, you start meeting some team members, you know, it, if you feel like the chemistry is off, you know, you might want to, you know, cut the cord. So uh, the chemistry was there. I think the environment was there. I think the, you know, like mindedness was there. Um, all those things in that list of stuff to consider, I think was there in terms of the audience, the, the network and value add, the content creation, 
the uh, voice that I have into the ICP that you guys want to reach. I think that definitely checks the box. So yeah, I guess you could say it was a bit of a match made in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm down with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then actually, I suppose going a bit on to more about what you're saying there, it's like I'm working together in a more like day-to-day sense. So I'm, how you work with an influencer um like to to get the most success out of it and i think this has changed a little bit maybe since when i made this presentation um so i think it'll be really cool to get your perspective on this as well katano but the one of the the fundamentals though is kind of exactly the same so so we like to get the most out of the relationship and partnership together is that you really need to be hitting those uh, content uh, creation goals and then using it to promote. There's no point creating a ton of content and then it never gets used or there's no point in having the partnership and then you never actually get any of that content created because you're just thinking about, you're just over planning it, thinking about it. So you have to get that structure in there. Um, And the way we do it is we'll pair um, any uh, influencer that we work with, a demand generation manager, and a content manager. So the content manager is to ensure that we actually get that content created um, and brief ideas um, to the influencer, get their feedback, whether it's something they can do, whether it's something they're able to 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 like do, or whether they have any new ideas and want to and would add to it, give anything um, a new perspective on it. And then the demand generation manager keeps it moving. So it's they're the ones maybe pushing for the content that's needed and then making use of that content in every possible way um, uh, to, so it's, that it's actually used in all those promotional opportunities as well as make, keeping like those live events and things running that, that, we're, basically, that we're basically sat on now. So, uh, you know, shout out to Jamie for keeping, for keeping that moving. But um, I suppose I know actually with you, Katana, we actually, and you can really bring people into the team like we work actually a lot with Katano just through Asana. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you have any insights for people here and how you find it working with the team and how and how that that relationship works. Yeah, I you know, I, I, I like the organization system of keeping things in Asana. That's pretty good. Sp- spreadsheets can also work if you're looking to keep it super basic and bare bones. But, um, you know, I, w- I would say that... Uh, you, you need a, a, a point of contact within the company that, you know, has that really close line of communication with the influencer that you're going to work with. And uh, there, there is a good bit of, you know, back and forth that needs to happen. Like a lot of times there is brainstorms that need to occur in order to really get the juices flowing. Um, and it may be things as simple as like, yo, what are you seeing in the industry this quarter? What are you seeing this month? What are some trends that you're noticing Um, in your day-to-day client work? What are things that are coming up in your DMs on LinkedIn? What are people asking you about, Uh, you know, on Twitter? What are some things that you're noticing, right? Just stuff like that to sort of say, yeah, I'm noticing these new, you know, thoughts coming out. I'm getting these kinds of questions. These are, you know, kind of recurring things that I'm seeing in my day-to-day client work. Here's things that are regularly coming up. And so you kind of do need a little bit of that, um, openness and flexibility. Like, I think it's really hard to say in January, we're going to map out everything we're going to talk about this year. I don't think it can be that rigid. It kind of, I I would even say for the way we're doing it with Cognizum, it is very flexible and it tends to kind of um, be more of a free flowing kind of activity rather than, all right, here's what we're going to do for the quarter. Here's all the topics that are going to be mapped out for, you know, each week to week to week to week. Like, I don't think it can work that way you kind of need to approach this almost on the fly. So it does feel to some degree like you're shooting from the hip, but it's more organized than that. It's the point is that it needs to kind of adapt to the things that are happening within the market rather than, all right, you know, here's what we're going to do from here to the end of the quarter or here till, you know, the end of the year. Like that's just way too complex, I think. And you you know, you're going to be too rigid if you think of it that way. So that's probably the best advice I would give in terms of the mechanics, like keep it open, keep it free flowing. You know, you can do a month plan ahead, but I think too much beyond that, you're going to be a little bit um, lost in the sauce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We definitely, we're like, we have those um, like working. uh, And if anyone's watched any of the previous episodes with like our role with relevancy and working through that, 
that easy mode framework. Um, and we'll, so we'll have these content topics, but I think it's really important, as you say, like with, we don't force it, right? We've got we've got the content topics and then we'll come to Gatane for for his for his opinion on those um, to add to that content, like, uh, yeah, content uh, depository that really we've got of, uh, on those specific topics. But we have to leave it open, right? Because we need to be, be staying relevant and actually still have like a point of view um, that is relevant rather than just something we're just trying to say for the sake of it. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So how does how does sometimes creating this content look like? So um, this is kind of an idea as well as how you can like, you can fit in as much as possible with as little activity needed. So um, this is kind of like a bit meta, it's an example of like almost what we're doing now, but you can have uh, work with your influencers to have like a live event and from that live event, you can break it out into loads of different, uh, like loads of different um, channels. Um, and it's like classic content re uh, um, repurposing here. So you get your live event, you use that live event to create a blog and write up about the topic that you've talked about. You take that live event and you take the snippets and you promote them on paid social, you get that live event and you post uh, those snippets back through the influencer social as well as your own organic social. Um, you can then strip that live events audio and create a podcast out of it um, if it's not super visual and, and um, it will work as a podcast. And then you can take like the summaries of the things that are discussed on that live event and rewrite it up as like a newsletter um, and and promote it to the news audience, newsletter audience there. So you can you don't have to have like a ton of activity where you're booking out hours of that person's time. Uh, you can just do smaller um, act like a smaller amount of activities and repurpose it in a ton of different ways um, uh, to get the, that, to basically create that authority at scale. Um, and that's what you're really looking for, like that authority at scale. So that all of the content that you're promoting out there, every bit that you're pushing, whether it's your newsletter, podcast, blog, has like an opinion, has a voice, has um, something that people want, have, have has information from like a person that, that people want to hear from, uh, most importantly. So then everyone's thinking, I imagine, is how do you measure it? Like, okay, great. I get the concept of having an influencer to make my content better, but uh, I've got to report this back. I need to know how I can sell this upwards um, and measure the impact of having a subject matter expert. So I like to divide reporting in my brain into two parts. Um, so having engagement and conversions. Now, when it comes to measuring the effect of uh, uh, an influencer on your content, engagement is your primary measure of success. So your engagement metrics will show you actually how well your influencer and their content is resonating with your with your audience. Um, and that's actually the aim of it, right? You're aiming to resonate with your audience and engage them. So that is the bit that you need to be measuring. The rest, the conversions, will come later as soon as you've got people engaging and listening. So metrics that you will then track, obviously, if you're looking at engagement metrics, which may be deemed by some like traditional vanity vanity metrics but these are super important so you're looking at are, are people liking commenting following watching the videos view through what's the reach on those posts that you're putting out we're including that audience we're including that influencer page views on the blog on their um, blogs written with bounce rate time on page scroll depth are people engaging is the inf the, the fact that it's from that influencer increasing metrics uh, across the board there um, then on like the podcast, exactly the same, like subscribers, total listens, the average audience size that it's pulling in and attendee numbers um, to uh, both live events um, and, and uh, yeah, and any events that you put out there. And then also, and a key one, and I think is one that we, people don't include enough in their reporting back is feedback directly from ICP and sort of replies to, to post put out there in newsletters as well. Then I think you can then look at conversions, um, which you don't want to be entirely guided by because it's not always easy to attribute these, but that you should be able to start to see stuff come through um, that will attribute some of these conversions back um, to your to the, your influence activity. And you can get this through stuff like through self-reported attribution by having that how did you hear about us field on your form or thank you page. You'll find that people will start to mention uh, your subject matter influences. They'll be like, ah, oh, you know, Gatano was, uh, I saw Gatano was working with you. Um, 
uh, or like I've been speaking to Tane for a while. He he recommended you anything like this. Uh, I listened to the podcast with Tane. These are now you're starting to see that like you can literally pull out names and and see where people are being dropped uh, dropped in as finding that's where they heard about you. Um, you can also see it in first and last such UTMs if you're putting these things out on paid social and you're actually making sure that you name those uh, video snippets correctly with your um, the subject matter expert that's involved in them, then you can start to see that come back through in conversions of people watching your video and then clicking back through uh, to your website to submit a demo and catching them there. Uh, we also set up things like anonymous conversions on LinkedIn, which is just showing us the number of conversions that maybe uh, an ad has... Um, uh, has like led to within like 30 days so that might be that they've looked they clicked through to like a blog written by your influencer and then left but then 30 days later come back and submitted a demo request so you can start to provide some attribution there that 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 was like the content that they engaged with and people also mentioned them on discovery and demo calls so you just want to be listening into those gone calls and getting the qualitative information there as well as people will immediately come on and say where they've where they've heard about you or where they've seen you um but i know uh i know you katano probably received quite a lot of different uh messages back probably when you post relating to cognizant as well so it'd be kind of interesting from your experience the sort of sort of replies that you get and what people are sort of like asking and, and questions about that yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I love dividing it into two parts, how you've broken it out here. Um, <clears throat> definitely the engagement is the primary measure of success for sure. Um, I, you know, I'm a, I actually haven't seen any real like, hey, here's how, you know, how much resonance all your videos have had for us. Here's, you know, the ROI, so to speak, of, you know, helping us break into the US market, whatever. Um, but, you know, I, I, I figured that uh, there hasn't been any complaints. <laughs> so I'm going to assume like on that front, things have been good. But even I can see like from any time I post stuff, share stuff, uh, the response is quite positive. Um, in terms of conversions, you know, like I have been getting more people DMing me saying, hey, we're thinking about Cognizant. Uh, You know, what's your take on compliance? Or we're thinking about Cognism. What's your take on, do they have access to this kind of data that I need, which is very specific or, Hey, we're thinking about Cognism. Here's my current stack. You know, what do you think I could replace with Cognism? I feel like I'm using too many tools. Uh, do I feel like I have the best phone number data, right? That kind of thing. I'm getting a lot more questions like that coming into my DM. Uh, and a lot of times I don't really know how to answer some of that stuff. So I will hit up you guys and be like, Hey, how should I respond to this? So there's a lot of that, but, um, at the end of the day, it's, it, it, you know, don't be guided by conversions is a great way to approach it because if you guys were only measuring this by conversions, I think you'd probably be disappointed. Um, you know, the reality is how often do you think companies are looking to switch their data provider? It probably doesn't happen too much. You know, probably something has to happen with their current provider, such as, you know, data breaking or data not being good enough or whatever for them to really consider a change event. So obviously you guys are doing the work to fill the future funnel and stay top of mind, working with people like me, Morgan, and whoever else. But um, I think in terms of how you, how you measure success, this is the right way to think about it. And uh, I suppose on to some of the results then, uh, maybe these aren't like actually personal to, to our specific uh, partnership, but when we were working with Brian last year, I, I, at the end of the year, I looked at uh, the results that we were able to get from from working with Ryan over that year. And like, for example, on the engagement side, we had a 421% increase um, in podcast downloads in 2022. We'd had 295% increase in subscribers with the newsletter in 2022. And we had... Uh, we'd actually doubled our attendance rate on our live shows. And then there's some like qualitative feedback that I've popped in there as well, that people used to message Ryan about the content that he created um, and was involved in. And then when we look at the conversion side, so uh, we, when we looked at self reported attribution, we actually found that at that uh, time we put, created a category called uh, that we called influencer, just when anyone that any subject matter experts or influencer we worked with was called out. And they made up the fourth biggest uh, self-reported attribution. So, like the like fourth most, there did people come in and mention someone like an influencer we'd been working with. 
And then when I added uh, other categories into that, like overall categories of like people who mentioned social in some way or webinar or podcast, something that those the influencers were then all over as well, like they were involved in those channels, um, that would actually that actually constituted 24% of all of our um, submissions. So you can really start to see then how it bleeds in. Even if I can't say, you know, all of the leads came directly to Katana and then through the demo form, uh, it's coming uh, it's coming through across the board, like in all of the content that we're creating. And that graph at the bottom, I think really is important to show is that how that then um, is like how we can look at that from a top down point of view that actually all over the from last year where we started working with Brian as well and, and really executing the strategy, we can see that our inbounds climbed from um, uh, from April all the way up to September um, from like, I think we're like, like 600 inbounds a month to up to 1,800 and you sometimes you just like a zoomed out approach is enough to know that something's working as well. Uh, you don't always have to have like this direct attribution uh, to it at all. And then on to specifically some of the activity that then we've worked um, with Katana on. So we've, uh, you know, so the Loop podcast has grown 900% since Q1 uh, uh, into Q2 uh, as Katana's uh, been more involved as well. And as we can see, like as well, some of the posts that we've um, shared through Katana's account as well, we've got over a thousand more views than on average that we would normally uh, would have normally achieve and was featured in the HREFs uh, newsletter as well. So that's like just getting access to audiences then that we wouldn't have ordinarily been able to um, through through Katana. Um, and by having that authority on the podcast, we've been able to obviously grow listeners as well, who people who just want to hear from what um, Katana has to say. So yeah, there's a there's some results. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I like it. You know, I, I think it's very validating. Um, look, I, I you know, I'll give you guys a little bit of a history on it. Um, five, six years. It was six years ago, actually. I realized that um, you know I need to do something in terms of growing a network for myself, just for my own professional, you know, securing my professional future. Because your network is your net worth to an extent. And, you know, I saw a lot of people, um, you know, doing a lot of different techniques. Like I saw some people going all in on YouTube. I saw some creators going all in on a newsletter. I saw some creators blogging. Like, you know, one of my idols from the early days of SEO was Rand Fishkin and his, you know, infamous Moz, um, you know, series on Whiteboard, Whiteboard Fridays and, you know, really uh, thoughtful blogging, not only on his own platform, but guest blogging. And then I realized like, I, you know, all these people are successful because they pick something and they stick with it over a long period of time. All the best creators who have really grown and shared their knowledge and become notable in the space have picked something and stuck with it. They didn't try to do too many things and they didn't give up too fast. They picked one thing and they stuck with it over a long period of time. So back in 2017, I'm like, all right, well, I, this, at this time, I just left Pipe Drive and I became uh, the um, head of marketing at Sales Hacker. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I'm at that point where I need to pick something because I need to secure my, you know, future in this industry by growing a network. And I need to I have some unique perspectives and thoughts. I want to get it out there. So I decided LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the place that I'm going to commit. And I said to myself, I'm going to just post stuff once a week. I'm going to try and make it as valuable and helpful as possible. And every single person that comments on my stuff that I'm not already connected with, I'm going to send them a, a, a personalized connection request and literally connection by connection, post by post over a five-year period. You know, I've been able to grow a nice sizable network of high quality people. I've been really trying to keep it about quality, you know, not just connecting with every single, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry out there people who are in my space who I want to be connected with. So that is B2B marketers and B2B sales primarily. So over that five-year period of posting once a week and engaging with everybody once a week, I've actually done a lot of that legwork that most brands, you know, they, they can't do, haven't done, aren't willing to do, aren't capable of doing. So Cognizant actually found a shortcut. They said, this guy built a network for five years on LinkedIn. Why don't we just get access to the work he's done? Why don't we just do that? Because we don't have anybody really at Cognizant that's done that. I think you, you guys now have definitely 
built a roster of people who are doing that and have been doing it for a while, maybe not for five years in a row, but you definitely have some heavy hitters on the roster who are starting to become more well-known, more engaging, building a larger network, right? And the way the algorithm has shifted, it actually rewards engagement within your own first degree network more than it does the outside second degree and third degree. So it rewards um, familiarity and engagement within your own realm. That's why having quality in your network is key. So, you know, it's not really super surprising to me that when I, you know, post certain stuff and it does well, why it does well, because I've cultivated that audience and network over time, but the, the relevance and the alignment is also there. You know, it's not like I'm promoting toothbrushes. So uh, with all, if you combine all those factors together, this is kind of what you get. So you want to work with somebody if you're a brand that has done some of this groundwork. You know, you want to check their consistency over time. You want to check their quality. And, and those are the things to really look at. And, you know, in terms of the results, I'm, I'm really pleased with it. And I, you know, I hope I can continue uh, you know, this partnership with Cognizant for as, you know, as long as the wheels will, will ride this thing. And that's <laughs> kind of where it's at. Yeah. Yeah. And the, so then some of the other um, work that we've done as well. So, um, so we also interviewed Katana to get expert uh, insights for our newsletter. So in the last few months, newsletter um, subscribers have increased by 25% and our click-through rate rate from 1.5%. Nine percent to four point five percent. So I think that says a lot as well. <laughs> is is this going to be my uh, my my influencer press kit that I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, am I going to use to pitch other companies? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can give you a we can give you a media pack afterwards. Yeah. Oh, this is gold. Send me this deck. <laughs> Um, and we've also doubled our engagement rate uh, per impression in Q2 to Q1, um, partially uh, due to these um, like these uh, uh, videos that actually Katana does, which I love. And this is where I think this content creator side comes in. We give uh, some narratives that we and like some ideas that we want Katana to talk about um, uh, the and uh, and like record himself talking about now. Katana could have done them, stood where he is now uh, at home uh, with a with a plain background, but uh, he goes out and he does them in some absolutely fantastic locations, which uh, I think creates that stop it, that stop in the feed. Right? They just want to know one, what is Katano saying, but two, where the hell is he as well? So um, I think that comes that balance of like you know knowing what you're talking about, but also knowing what content hits. Um, uh, yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah i i think i think there's something to be you know in terms of the style of video um there's something cool about just kind of off the cuff walk the walk and talk videos um people really like them i and i think you know the visually appealing content really does stand out sometimes i'm in uh because I, I travel for for various things like client events, conferences. Sometimes I just want to go somewhere else and see my friends. And usually every time I go somewhere new, I, 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 you know, try and take advantage of the opportunity to do a little content creating. And so like, sometimes I'll be in the mountains of Arizona with a super cool backdrop. Uh, I live in Florida, so I have, you know, automatically a lot of cool stuff to, to walk around and you can see in the background, like palm trees, water, you know, cool streets, like stuff like that. Um, and I just try and make it a 90 second hitter. You know, I try to keep it, you know, a minute and a half to two minutes maximum. Honestly, they're just rants. So back to <laughs> back to how I work with Cognizant, you know, um, me and Amy, who's been really driving the influencer program, she'll be like, yeah, you know, here's the angles we're thinking. Here's here's, you know, some of the topic ideas we have for, you know, your short verticalized videos for this month. And I'll go through the list and I'll be like, all right, this I don't really like. This is cool. This is great. I can talk really confidently about this this idea, let's tweak this one. I'll be like, Hey, Jamie, you know, another guy that drives the influencer program, uh, at Cognizant, I'll be like, what's the angle you're thinking about? So sometimes it's the top level idea. Sometimes it's like, all right, I get the top level idea, but what's the angle. And then I'll just have that list and I'll block out a day and, uh, you know, I'll just go and I'll be like, all right, here's, here's what I'm going to talk about today. Here's the, the location. And I just whip out the good old iPhone, put it into cinematic mode pop in the ed the headphones and just you know walk and talk and just rant away so um that's basically 
that's basically how it works yeah <laughs> it works i love it um I'm, I'm excited to see them when they come out to be honest as well i want to know where you are <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I th those are some examples right there, like, you know, cool balconies. Sometimes I'm walking around the beach. Sometimes it's just uh, in the back streets of Miami. Sometimes it's, um, you know, in Arizona in a mountain or something like that. So it's like, you know, anytime I have a cool backdrop, I try and take advantage of it. <laughs> um, so then a question that I think a lot of people ask when we've mentioned about having influences and working, especially with like external partners before, I was like, okay, but like, what if they leave your, you'll lose all the investment in their audience and you'll no longer have access to it. Well, one of the best things that actually happened for us on our experiment of it is Ryan did leave. He came to the end of the year and he decided that he didn't want to continue doing it. Um, he had other things he wanted to focus on, like he owned his own business anyway. So he had, he had a lot going on as well. Um, but the, the audience is only like a fraction of the benefit and that's the way to look at it. Uh, as I said before, there's so much more that you gain from working with an influencer than just the audience. Um, and realistically the most valuable thing, number one is the content, all of those, all of those videos that you have and everything, uh, that you get created, you won't lose. And you've got that for, to, to reuse and repurpose and like, and resurface when you need as well. In that time as well, in that year, our brand was highly exposed to a super engaged audience for like an extended period of time. So all 28K of Ryan's followers, or a lot of them anyway, maybe that's super, that's quite optimistic, but still a huge portion of Ryan's followers now knew who Cognizant were and they didn't potentially before. And that that's huge. That's like, doesn't matter then if that, that partnership ends, like you've, you've got that exposure that you needed and like, in the for cognizant we we needed more exposure in the us and ryan was able to provide that for us as well so it was that you that that part will always be there as well and then you can also just don't pull your eggs in one basket uh have multiple influences so that you know you lose one audience you pick up another and you keep working that way and you should as katana said we've we've been trying to do internally obviously it takes time like where you you jump the queue when you work with an external influencer because they've maybe put the groundwork in for five years but you can start to create influences internally as well that will, will benefit you so when we say we've had multiple influences we work with morgan engram as well on the on the sales side um as obviously well as um katano as well like um as um on the marketing side so creating your own internal influences that's uh then always an interesting one um so you, uh, we'd say, I say you should uh, create uh, in B2B influencers in-house and get the, your SMEs talking and pushing uh, them out there. Uh, I think there are some pros and cons to it, basically, um, that it does take time for to build um, someone as an influencer profile. I feel like we're very, we're, we've done a good job with um, David, David Bentham, who's a VP of sales development. We've done a lot of work to build his profile and we've built that up. And Alice has also uh, become very well known in um, uh, B2B SaaS marketing as well. So we, I feel like those are two that we've really, we've built out and, and, and done really well with, but it has taken time. There are cons to have, pros and cons to having um, uh, in-house influencers versus external. I think it's always good to have both. You know, one is that a car, like a pro is that they're closer to the brand and more affiliated. So they're going to be more likely to say exactly what you want them to say. Uh, going to be completely fitting to um, your like your company uh, product, uh, all of that narrative as well. But naturally, they'll have an assumed bias by followers. They're less likely to get someone messaging them about cognizant like Gatano would because the person messaging them knows what's going <laughs> what will be next. and <laughs> It's going to be, you know by now please uh so that that like assumed bias will always be there so you have to you have to uh, understand that in the audience that then they create and the other thing is it's like it's not their day job um you are it takes time to like carve it out in their in their diary and explain also to other stakeholders why it's important that it's taking up some of their time when they maybe have like in dave's like uh position like 50 SDRs to, to oversee. So um, there's that side as well that you have to carve out and like um, and prove it, the importance to them and also uh, to the business as well. But 
to give an example of how having both external and internal influences can come together um we have like an example here with our uh, what i would call is a really an influencer activated campaign which was the diary of a first time cmo um that we released uh published by alice um de Corsi, our cmo so we launched the book um and we entirely promoted it via influencers really on LinkedIn. So we worked, we promoted it via all the profiles we've been trying to build mm -hmm. at Cognizant, as well as working with uh, influencers like Katano that we've been working with and other uh, influencers in the sort of, in our sort of space and field that we um, had relationships with. And we just, we sent them a book and asked if they could, they could post it um, on our behalf and promote it as well. And I mean, these results were actually just like a month after the the diary was released. Um, I it's, it's definitely um, all of these would have changed by now. But I think actually in that thirty day window is is really um, cool to actually see how how much grew. Like we, you know, there was none of us promoting it uh, paid or via uh, email at this point or anything like this. It was purely on the back of people's followings and creating that sense of like, oh well, if if Gatano's recommending this. I've got to see it, uh, but on a scale with lots of other influencers as well. And we ended up with a 4K waiting list for the book. We had uh, 145 books given to early birds and a further 80 given to customers. We ended up listing it on Amazon and over 1,200 were sold within the first uh, 30 days. And on the audio book we created, it, we had 3,000 unique listeners with uh, four and a half thousand unique views on uh, on the online ebook version as well, all within those first 30 days. So it was a huge amount of engagement, a huge success on what really was um, a diary full of repurposed content that uh, Alice had actually posted about over, over those last three years as CMO, um, her journey on it. So yeah, super cool. Um, that we were able to do that. And I mean, you were part of the process, Gatano, so uh, I'm sure you probably got lots of feedback about the book as well. Yeah, pe people love the book. Um, I think it was a pretty smart idea to compile every LinkedIn post ever created into one manuscript. So not, not really, uh, I'm sure that was not an easy process, but you guys pulled it off. Um, not many companies actually can pull off a book, but you guys are one of the few that did it. So um, yeah, I think it was successful all around. Awesome. And then finally, um, I'd like to cover sort of like what's on the horizon for us with like a, an influencer program. So um, something we are like trying to look more into is like, and if you've uh, seen us talk about anything about the easy mode framework is that's like what we would call type three content, which is like entertaining um, or uh, edutainment content. Whereas like, I feel like we deliver a lot of value led content, but um as you probably see on LinkedIn, there's lots of people like delivering fun, uh, entertaining content at the same time, which provides and gets you into a, a different part of a network as well. You know, some people are, are more ready to learn from something that's going to make them laugh, uh, engage them that way than they are maybe from something more uh, value led and educational. So that's one. That's something we're looking to expand into and like push out. Um, through different of our influencer channels, as well as um, move further into other channels outside of LinkedIn. So there's also this concern about being stuck in like a LinkedIn bubble uh, by nature. Social, uh, social media creates bubbles. Um, so we're looking, how can we move into uh, things like TikTok as well, uh, or maybe expand further on YouTube and like grow uh, influencer followings uh, there as well. And then something I thought that oh, we've, uh, you might have seen is like uh, what Lavender AI do, which is really cool, is they've created like this team of creators and influencers, really. Um, and I suppose that's something we're kind of rep trying to replicate in a different way uh, at Cognizant as well. But I think you could have you can have this whole team of like e external and internal creators sort of working together, um, but maybe like combining those more often. Um, it's like a, a really cool idea. Um, and then, yeah, ultimately, just to continue to grow then that that internal and external influencer base that we have. But um, I don't know if you've got anything more to add there that you think is potentially on the horizon for for influencers and B two B Katano. I think you nailed it, man. I think this is this has been comprehensive, and you know, you hit all the big points. So nothing really much more to add. Awesome, cool. Well, I know we're a little bit over there, so thanks to everyone who's. Uh, 
stuck through. Um, we'll be able to come back and answer any of the uh, um, questions that have been put in the, the chat um, afterwards uh, at a later time. But um, I'll let everyone go now. But thanks so much for joining uh, us, Gatano. And thanks uh, for uh, everyone who's come and tuned in as well. And hope uh, you feel a little bit clearer about the, the B2B um, influencer uh, landscape. Thanks, Liam. Take Cheers. care, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.